Okay, so shall we begin with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we have great need of you. As Daniel had seen before, we have all sinned. We have all walked away from the covenant that you have presented us. We have said, this we will do, and yet we have followed not. Forgive us, Father, direct us and help us. Prepare us in this way so that that which we do may bring glory to your name, that we may understand more clearly and more fully that which you would have us to say, help us as you help Moses, so that we may put away our thoughts that are of this world and be prepared to come into a true relationship with you. For we do not understand what it means to come into your presence. Help us and guide us to this end. Direct us now. May your angels attend us. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. We're going to do a little bit of a recap, but then we're going to go into several, several points. Last week, as we were talking, we were addressing the, the situation that Malachi 2 looks to be very figurative. It's not just literal. It is mm -hmm. figurative for our time. So when Mrs. White was writing the following, she was being extremely blunt and extremely direct for us. To false teachers in our day, as well as to those living in Malachi's time are spoken the words. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Now, can we apply this to the way that, that things have occurred before and since July 18th? Well, yeah. I mean, we can definitely even look at uh, ourselves. Like, yes, Mark, go uh, ahead. I, I being very sorry about the prayer I paid for my dad uh, sending the shadow can you can uh, as in prayer to Lord now dad uh, sending the side door, it was a loud noise, it bugging as in prayer to Lord. Oh. Just uh, all yeah. over again. Well, well, we didn't hear I it. Did, uh, now I did stop my dad, like he's doing now, just uh, over again in the prayer. Okay, but we, we didn't I, hear you. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I can't hear you. You couldn't hear the prayer. So you want us no. to pray again? Yes, please. Okay. Do you want me to pray? Go ahead. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit uh, into our hearts. We pray for Mark that he can understand and listen and pray for each of us, Lord, that we can hear your voice speaking to us. 
through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So as we continue, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. Who is being described here as being Judah? And once we establish that, then who is being described as being Israel and in Jerusalem? Hmm. So, so are we to take these like Israel to refer to not just uh because sometimes you know Judah is it's just you know Judah and Israel can refer to the same thing. Because Israel doesn't exist in that time. Northern Israel doesn't exist in the time of Malachi. Um, so often you can talk about Judah and Israel. Because Judah is part of Israel. Right. But an, an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. So... Uh, uh, excuse me, please. Say be rude. Um, do you check my email I did send for on this link for today okay. morning? I no, Mark, Mark, no, I didn't. But anyway, we you, this is not part of the study. Can you keep it on track because you're interrupting Dwight's study? Oh, sorry, I Okay. So anyway, You're fine, I Mark. Don't I know. I okay. Don't I know. Now, we'll talk about it later, Mark. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, so I asking that question for tonight. How yep. I get that? I'll we'll talk after the study. Okay, sir. Yep. So yep. anyway. Sure. Okay, so would we be incorrect to apply Israel as America, Jerusalem as the church, and Judah as the movement? Uh, I don't know if I would do that. I don't. Okay. Any other mm. thoughts? Okay. Okay, so Judah's married the daughter of a strange god. Correct. So who's the daughter of a strange god in our time? I'm saying that this is the Protestant way of study. Okay. Now Judah Judah can refer Judah and Jerusalem can refer to the church. Right to Adventism. Okay, but and, and Israel can refer to Protestantism. So what I I guess okay then if we take it in this way, Israel is Protestantism, mm -hmm. Jerusalem as the Church, Judah as the movement. Yeah, but I wouldn't put Judah as the movement. I would just say Judah and Jerusalem are the same thing. I don't make a distinction between them. Judah, Jerusalem's the capital of Judah, but it's, I, I wouldn't put them as a separate symbol. Well, all I'm asking is because Judah is one small part of that which we find in Jerusalem. That's why well, that's why I was giving some, a, a type of delineation here. Yeah. Well, Judah just to me refers to the country and Jerusalem to the capital. Okay. All right. 
this is one of the struggles that I've been having with this part of it. Now, all of these articles, and I believe there's five that Mrs. White wrote that were published in Southern Watchmen in 1905, are amazing as to how they approach the situation that we find in the last days. Mm -hmm. Now, as this continues, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of, of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. Now, when we're looking at this portion that says the Lord will cut off the man that, that marries the daughter of a strange God, mm -hmm. he will cut off the master and the scholar, what words are we really seeing here? Um, well, the teacher and the scholar. Okay. The teacher and the student. Teacher and student. Right. Which gives us, it, since we're looking at this figuratively, who, who would the teacher be and who would the student be? How would we apply that to today? I don't know. Fingers and ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and tongue. You call off. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the master and the scholar out of the tabernacle. So I would think that this refers to the educated class within Adventism. Okay. So, so the master, this would be our universities and, and the people that are taught in those universities. So they're going to be cut off out of the tabernacles of Jacob. Okay. Because the alternate reading for this would be, the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, him that waketh and him that answereth, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. Yeah. So instead of the master and the scholar, they use the, the one that waketh. Now, and that's just the Hebrew idiom. Okay. Right. So, um, uh, so in this. Are you looking at a text? What text are you looking yeah, at? Yeah, it's Malachi 2.12. Um, because this word, ana, which, um, which properly is the eye, right? Or to pay attention. That's, that's the word that's scholar. So the one that's watching or paying attention is the student. And then the master is the one who opens the eyes. So this is just the Hebrew expression for a teacher and a student. That's why they translate it master and the scholar. Okay. Okay. Does that does that clear a few, clear up a few things, Chris? What's your thoughts? Um, I'm just getting connected and getting into it, so I, I'm okay. uh, not a problem. Out. I mean, the the purpose for today is going to be a conversation. This this is the portion that is offering some some really deep thought but it's one that's really difficult. So we're getting a picture as the verse is stating that Judah has dealt treacherously and that they profane the holiness of the Lord, which he ought to have loved and has married the daughter of a strange God. We know our history because by 1863, we were setting aside the, the type of study that Father Miller had used that gave an awakening to all Protestants throughout the world. No longer were they choosing to use line upon line. They were setting this aside to say, 
that this is not scholarly. This is not what wise people will do. Yet, this is what our Heavenly Father ordained, mm -hmm. comparing verse upon verse. Mm -hmm. And this ye have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he that delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Our Heavenly Father has been allowing us time to recognize the fact that we have not been keeping his covenant. We have not been looking at or addressing his covenant as we are supposed to. So the question I asked last week, what was the first love of the pioneers? And metaphorically, what has been abandoned? Well, prophecy. Prophecy has been abandoned most definitely. Mm -hmm. This has been set aside. There are so many situations that we're seeing in the Adventist church, in the Protestant churches, all the way through. So many of the examples that our Heavenly Father has given have been pushed aside because the attitude has become all we need is the love, the love, the love. But what love do we really show? I mean, it's, it's great that, you know, they want to say that God so loves the world that everyone can be saved. Mm -hmm. all, all I know is um, in my experience with the people who talked about love all the time, is they tended to be the most unloving right and the, and the most judgmental and cruel and um yeah i could tell you a few stories which i won't but um i did a sermon well two ser sermons in warburg church some years ago one in 2014 the first one entitled love part in part one and part two um part one is on my youtube page but in there when i present love it's definitely not what people think of as love um, because when I, when I think of God being love, uh, it's in contrast to humanity. Cause God is love to know what love is. You have to know God, but we just fill in our definition of what love is. And that's not what's revealed in the Bible. Well, one of the, one of the points that we've been addressing. Mm -hmm. when we take when we take a good look at exodus 19 mm -hmm. we find that our heavenly father wanted to make the entire nation of israel a nation of priests for the entire world mm -hmm. now this covenant was offered not only to the direct parties that were of the nation of Israel, but it was offered to the mixed multitude as well. Mm -hmm. When we look at this, God is showing that if we do what he has said we are to do, then he is able and willing to do exactly what he is offered to do. But we let our own humanity, our faults, our sin get in the way. Mm -hmm. So we're showing in many ways that we love ourselves much more than we love God. Mm -hmm. And isn't that just exactly the problem that they had 
with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Yeah. They didn't have a Christ-like character. And, and they didn't know that they didn't. There's so much more that, that was being addressed, you know, through this and with this. But I, you know, I shudder when I'm studying things like this and going through what God was offering to do with the children of Israel when he is saying to them, this is my covenant. When, when God offered his covenant to Abraham, what did he expect of Abraham? To trust in him. If we put it as one word, would we not say faith? Yeah, to have faith that God could take care of the situation that looked impossible. Right. Well, there's another word I'd like to add to that. Okay, please. Loyalty. Okay, I agree. Mm -hmm. If we do not have faith, how can we be loyal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't have faith, you can't please God. And when you have faith, you will be loyal because you understand this is what God is capable of doing without us interjecting any portion of our strength and our efforts. As we continue here, Malachi 2.13. And this you have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hath dealt treacherously. Yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Now, here again, the premise that this is being presented is that this is figurative and not literal. So if we're looking at this as the wife of thy youth and the wife of thy covenant, how should we see this represented? So this would represent their initial covenant that they made with God. Right. And they've, they betrayed that covenant. Well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. I think it's really direct that one of the, the fathers of the Protestant faith was a man by the name of Martin Luther, right? Yeah. Now, I found it really interesting when you go through Luther's writings, when he is asked about the, the time frame where they're going to see the fall occurring, the deadly wound. Mm -hmm that Luther makes it very clear that he didn't see that occurring in his lifetime, that it was going to be some 300 years hence. Mm -hmm. So he was coming to an understanding of the 2520, mm -hmm. and of the 2300 days that did not become publicly addressed yeah. until very much later. 
Mm -hmm. So how was he studying his Bible? He was proof texting. And, and he was reading it and praying for enlightenment from God. He wasn't, he wasn't looking to the scholars to answer the questions. Exactly. How many commentaries do you think Luther had? I don't well, think that, uh, there wouldn't have been any commentaries. Well, you know, this is this is the argument that I hear from so many that we need to use the commentaries because these are people that have had the time to study. Yeah. The only thing I use a commentary for is commentaries can sometimes refer me to other verses. Right. Right. But as far as when they make an interpretation, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Mostly because their interpretations are wrong. Even though they can give you other verses, they don't have the context in which to interpret it. They don't have the light. So they, so they give their opinion. And when it's just a matter of opinion, I'm not really too interested. I mean, I don't even like listening to my own opinions. It's something we both have had to learn that we cannot afford to listen to a lot of opinions, especially our own. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I still think there is a use for commentaries if you use them properly, which is just, you know, for getting references like the treasury of scripture knowledge in a sense that's kind of a commentary that the uh, the translators of the king james used um or, or created but even then you still anytime they have an opinion or interpretation it's not that useful but when you look at the verses that they give you those are useful okay so So when I've, when I've looked at this in Malachi and I start comparing other verses, mm -hmm. the wife of thy youth in Malachi 2.14, translators give a, a reference back to Proverbs 5.18. And that reads, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. In other words, this, this is to be cherished, mm -hmm. not set aside. Mm -hmm. And then when it says, yet she is thy companion, that reference goes to Proverbs 2.17, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Now, are we supposed to set aside what God has brought to us? Are we to set aside the 1843 and the 1850 charts? Are we to set aside the method of study? Proof texting. No. And, and it says, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Right. So, of course, the covenant would refer to the covenant of marriage. But that covenant of marriage, we're married to God. When he makes that covenant, it is that type of covenant. Yes, it is. Hmm. So it becomes it becomes a much deeper and stronger reason when we're looking at this. The warnings that are given to the priests at this time. It's saying that you've turned your back on God. You are not willing to accept the covenant that God has offered. When, we, when we've been studying our history, as we've been going back over all of the things that happened within FFA, all of the things where Elder Jeff had been leading us. We're seeing that there were many times, directly many times, that 
others, whether you're dealing with the path of the just, whether you're dealing with Emiliano, whether you're dealing with, well, Kevin Howard or um, Mark Bruce, mm -hmm. where instead of continuing to study as Father Miller would have us to study, they made the decision that, well, this, had, this makes more sense for me. And we're going to go off and we're going to study in a different manner. How is that different from what Uriah Smith did? How is that different from what we have seen that's been occurring since 1863? Mm -hmm. So... Malachi 2.16, for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Comment from the chat, Jeremiah 3. 6 to 19. A call to repentance to both Israel and Judah, who've proven treacherous, adulterous, forgiveness and restoration is promised on repentance. Well, the rest of that is when Judah and Jerusalem, the most favored of God's creation, are choosing to turn their back on what God has promised that he would do, it becomes something very sad indeed. How should we approach this at this time? I think we need to examine more fully the covenant because only by examining the covenant are we going to come into a truer understanding of what it means to properly represent God. Any thoughts on that? Well, it seems to me um, verse 15, it looks like, um, we humans are, we, um, we claim to be of the spirit, but yet we deal treacherously. We, we don't really understand what we're doing and we're doing that which is human in us, but it's not what the Lord would have us to do. How many times in the examples that we have in the Bible did we find that many were not doing what the Lord would have us to do? The example of Abraham, I think, is, is the best one that we could use. When Abraham is promised that he is going to have offspring as numerous as the stars above him. This was counted unto him for faith because he believed that God was capable of doing it, right? Yes. Now when we come down to the situation with Isaac, here is a man and for our time let's be straight up this was an old man he was counted as an old man when he was 75 years old by the nations that lived around him by this time he's 120 years old he has a 20 year old son and he is taking isaac to become the sacrifice mm -hmm. He now has to explain to this 20-year-old 
that you are going to be the sacrifice and God is capable to raise you back up. So even if you die, God is able. And how many of us, how many fathers would want to have to plunge a knife into the heart of a child, of our child? Mm -hmm. That took amazing faith. How many of us today have faith of that same level? Yeah, so the covenant that God made with Abraham is he basically told him something that was impossible and said that he would accomplish it, accomplish it and that you just need to trust that I will accomplish it. And God has done the same for uh, us. He's put before us God. things that are impossible. And he's asking us to trust in him. Yes. Um, hey, um, the door is the very good point about that. Your story, but a uh, witness. It, it, it is wrong. How is the point wrong, Mark? Um, God asked Adam to take his son. Abraham God, to take his son. Let, let me, me finish, Stephen. God asked Adam to take his son. Do that and make a uh, make make a place first. Um, and then really take knife on it on his son. God sent an angel to. Um, I don't uh, start again. My turn is your time. Okay, Mark. But Mark, uh, your question later. Uh, see you off. No, but Mark, it's we're talking oh, about man. Abraham. We're talking about Abraham when he offered up Isaac. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, and an angel came and stayed his hand. And then an angel yes, came. I am on. I am on that topic. You okay. got me. Lord, ask Adam to kiss her there. Do that. Get the face ready. Do it. Adam, really take the knife. Yeah. For his son. On there, put a uh, tie his head, hands behind his back and his legs, put something over his head, eyes, uh, and then we take his knife in his hand. God sent an angel to mm. stop him. Yeah, we know that. Not do that. Oh, angel, make Adam look at the lamb God sent to him. He did the lamb yeah. for God. He said, always do the lamb for so, God. So if we leave out some details, we're not wrong. Um, okay, Theodore. I understand how you think it's wrong, Theodore. Mark. Yeah, Mark. Um, his doing is that it is wrong. No. I, I, it's not did, wrong, Mark. I, no way, Mark. Mark you're uh, gonna have to stop. You have to stop. Ah, uh, crap, Mark. wow. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Okay, go on, Dwight. <laughs> so what the problem that Mark has is if we leave out some details, 
then he thinks it's wrong because he knows how the story goes. And all we're looking at right now is just a part of the story. Right. The whole, the whole, the whole premise of what, I, what I'm trying to say here is how many of us, how many parents would be willing to consider to sacrifice their own children if they were placed in the same position that Abraham was placed in? Right. So Abraham knew God's voice and he had faith and trust in God. Now, this is, this is what our Heavenly Father is expecting of us today. This is why the prediction of July 18th has carried a lot of weight with me personally. I don't have, I don't, I don't ever have, uh, one, sorry, excuse me please, one of my friends says, saying, we are very glad we don't, we are glad have no kids. We okay. never do that. Okay. I... Okay, go on, Dwight. So, long and short, we have been tested. Are we willing to accept that God is able to do what he said he's, he's going to do? God, mm -hmm. through his prophet, stated that this destruction was going to fall upon Nashville. Mm -hmm. We've covered this. We've addressed it. I believe we've all agreed on it. That's why we're here right now. Yeah, and, and we gave the warning like we were supposed to do. Exactly. That we were, that we were wrong about the date was not because we made some error. Right. That's the date that we were to give. We have given a date that gives a warning and that warning became worldwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just thought the event was gonna happen on that date, but that was the date that we were to give the warning for. That's what God indicated. Right. So it was more about us than it was about Nashville in that instance. In other words, were we willing to come to the top of the mountain with a knife in our hand to do the thing that, that God's prophet had said should not be done? And this is what Jeff said was being done, is we were being tested like Abraham was being tested in offering up Isaac. And yet we... Like Abraham, we believe that we had to do that, that, you know, what we were told was going to happen just as it was told for him. He's going to offer up his, his son Isaac. We thought Nashville was going to be hit with a nuclear bomb. But an angel stayed Abraham's hand. And some hand was stayed on July 18th. You know, and we also compared to the story of Jonah. So... To me, if we believe God, we have to believe that what we did was correct. Well, okay. We've compared the story of Jonah. We've compared it with the story of Abraham. We have mm -hmm. compared it with October 22nd, 1844. Mm -hmm. So now we have four examples. Are we willing in this situation to accept that the voice of God has said, this is going to occur? I believe the answer here is yes. Okay. We have a warning to the priests in Malachi 2. The priests in Malachi 2 are those that would be of the 144,000 and of the Levites. We are receiving a warning message to us that we need to have faith in what God is doing. We cannot afford in the least bit to think that this is a mistake. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the other issue that comes, okay, so, you know, we have the pandemic. Right. And, and basically people are saying that if we don't accept that this is the Sunday law, even though they're, they're not saying it in those words, but that's, that's the message that they're giving, then, then we are basically doing the same thing as the children of Israel in rejecting God. Correct. That's what they're saying. And, and I don't agree. No, we can't agree with them. No, because what they're doing is is in rejecting God by focusing upon the pandemic rather than what God is showing us. Well, in in the study that I've done for myself, mm -hmm. going back over this covenant and looking at the covenant as it would have been offered to the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Where were the complaints coming from? Well, the mixed multitude. And they were mixed multitude, why? Well, they're not of the children of Israel. They were of the children of Israel that had married Egyptians. Right. Married the Egyptian strange wives, yeah. Okay. Yet you have an example like Joshua, who was literally of, what wasn't he of, of Manasseh? Uh, Joshua? Or was he of Ephraim? Um, I always get mixed up. Yeah, I don't know. Um, not sure. Was he not I don't of, know. Uh, was he not of Judah? No. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought that he's of Judah, but and uh, Caleb was from Ephraim. Hmm. Yeah, because they were representing the different tribes. Uh, so I'd have to find it there. Okay, of Ephraim, we have Oshea, the son of Nun, which would have been Joshua. Okay, so he is Ephraim then. Okay. So then Caleb? Just a minute. I'm looking here. Caleb was of Judah. Son okay. of Jephunneh. Okay. okay, so yeah, Jephunneh is the way you pronounce it. But <laughs> okay, so so we're backwards. Okay. Okay, you're right. Um, now, when I look at this situation. Because you're talking about the covenant. So we're to make this covenant. Right. Our our line is talking about that covenant. Exactly. Okay. And and our line, um, I, I guess the way that I could put it is that people are ignoring the line. The people that ignore the line are ignoring the covenant. I would have to agree. But they're caught up in other things because what they want to do, and this is just my opinion about other people, but what they want to do is continue on the way that they were before. And we can't continue on the way we were before. Because if we can't recognize that we're, we're unworthy, that we, we can't do this, that all the Lord has said we cannot do and be obedient, because, because, there's, because this covenant isn't a covenant based upon our promises to God. It's based upon God's promises to us. And that's what we have to study. And that's the only way we're going to be safe. Because the way that I look at it is where right now this movement 
is no different than the world. It's no different than regular Seventh-day Adventists, you know, regular conservative Adventists. We have the same ideas and we're putting forth the same old, worn out old ideas that failed us in the past, that failed Adventism because they glorify self instead of glorifying God. That's my understanding of what's happening. They're doing the number one thing that we cannot afford to do. Yeah. And the thing is, we are doing it. We can't afford to do it either. Agreed. Right. So, it, I mean, there's no point looking at what someone else is doing other than to recognize we can't go in that direction. But it doesn't put us in any better stead with God just by recognizing it. Those that will give the final warning message are going to have the experience of the Mare. Mm -hmm. They will have understood the Calzone. They will have understood the Mara, and then they will have the Mare. But that Mare is what brings them to the understanding that their righteousness is not even as good as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, when, we, you know, I've studied a, a few times, presented uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and James chapter 1, dealing with the law of liberty, which is a glass that we need to look into. And that's based upon this covenant that was made when Moses met, went up the mountain the second time. Right. Right. The glory. Because we behold in a glass the glory of the Lord until we are changed into that same image from glory unto glory. So that's the mare. It's interesting, too, because like you're saying, this was the second time that he went up the mountain. Right. The and, first. Yeah. Had, keep going. And, and the Israelites, they didn't want to look. Right, they had Moses put a veil over his face. And that veil still remains over our fate over our faces now. Isn't it interesting? Mm -hmm. When Moses went up on the mountain the first time, Mrs. White is very clear that he spent time putting away his common thoughts. Then he was on the mountain with God. For 40 days, right? Mm -hmm. He comes back with these two tables. Mm -hmm. And the two tables are written on both sides by the finger of God. Now, within a few days after this, after here, here's Moses, he comes back down the mountain. They think there's a noise of war. At least that's what Joshua has said. Mm -hmm. And Moses goes, no, they're singing. He comes all the way back down and he finds that here are the children of Israel. They're not just sacrificing to a strange God, but they're sacrificing and they are naked. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. They were they were drinking, they were reveling. They had their celebration in full mode. And Moses then shatters these two tables. He did not have the glory of God etched in his face then as he did the second time he went up on the mountain. Mm-hmm. And what we were talking about earlier, it's interesting to me to look at this, but I believe we can prove this from Scripture alone. That all of these events in the book of Exodus took place from chapter 12 through chapter 40. They took place during one embolismic year. So 
So God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's telling them, this will be the head of the year to you, the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the end of the year, the children of Israel are fully out of Egypt and they are they are yet at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. But they have accepted a covenant, set aside the covenant. They were promised to become priests to the entire world, a nation of priests, and they rejected this. How different is that? today from the position we find the church in and then here's Moses he's gone up onto the mountain again to receive the the testimony of God's character written by God again and when he comes back He's shining with the glory of God. Now, is that not representative of what the 144,000 will be like? Uh-huh. It's amazing that we look at this, that this, these are the events that all occur within the book of Exodus. Because aren't those that will be like Moses of the 144,000, won't they be shining God's character in everything that they do? Mm -hmm. So, this being said, how can we afford to put aside the covenant? How can we afford to think that the covenant that God offered to the nation was going to be different from the covenant that he provided to the priests? And the seven times of Leviticus 26 is front and center on this entire covenant. Mm -hmm. We have the land resting. We have all of these these commandments that God has given us in Leviticus 25 and Leviticus 26 that right now have been set aside and have been set aside for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yet, we can walk into almost any church and they're crying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit but they don't understand what that really means. Are we prepared to be able to face God on December 25th of this year? Are we prepared to stand in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor? I would have to think no. Uh Certainly not on our own. Certainly not on our own. I agree. Uh But are we prepared for it today? I mean, what, what Mrs. White has given us and what we're reading here in Malachi, I would say no. We are not prepared. So what are we to do? We cannot afford, as we go through this next verse, we cannot afford to have this describing us. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? 
when you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Okay, I'm going to read from the chat. Malachi 2.13. The custom of hiring professional mourners for the dead comes to my mind. Since God doesn't accept this din over the altar, I figure it's fakery, maybe self-pity, thinking God too harsh toward them. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Also the tumult and confusion of so-called charismatic meetings. Well, I don't know how to approach that. Well, the whole thing though is I... It's easy to sort of direct this at someone else. Right. Some other thing, you know, the Protestants or whoever. But we have to be able to, to direct this at ourselves. Right. We do. Yeah. We have to direct this at ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm having to prepare for, for the next little step. So keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know because you ask what we are to do i mean obviously there's an individual work to do which we're all trying to do we're trying to study and understand and we have to trust that god's going to take care of the situation right and that he will reveal to us when we need it what it is we need to do So God's not going to show us beyond what we need for today. And what we need today right now is to hear this message and, and to figure out what it means to us individually. So as I keep looking at this, I look at what I'm seeing and what I'm reading here. Mm -hmm. and asking the question what of the covenant am i not keeping what of the covenant have i set aside what should i be doing differently mm -hmm. any thoughts That's really a work between each one of us and God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it is. I don't disagree. Well, at least we're taking a step in doing what we need to do, and that's studying. Right. So, I mean, that's all I know that I have to do is study and obey whatever God tells me to do in his word. Okay. Yeah, the difficult part, as you said, is looking into that looking glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't know what you don't know. So the things that we've hidden from ourselves, those are the things that that have to be addressed. And God brings us through experiences, though, to get us to examine our own hearts. And it's the hardest thing sometimes when we have to look at our, at our own hearts mm -hmm. and determine that which needs to change. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we just don't want to change. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to touch on a few things here. Malachi 3 is a portion of this book that to be able to discuss it, we're going to have to look at the figurative, but also the very literal portions 
that we're going to find here. And we're going to have to make decisions as to how we're going to see it applied. Malachi 3 verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So we can apply this, as I look at it, in three different ways right now. Malachi writes this, and the first literal application would be John the Baptist. The second literal application would be William Miller. I would have to place Jeff Pippinger as the third literal application. Would you have a problem with that? Yeah, so what you're doing is you're taking these as literal applications of messengers, the messenger of the covenant. Um, well, actually, okay, so the way that I read Malachi 3.1 is different than I've read it before. So behold, I will send my angel, because that's what messenger is, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye shall seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That would be Christ. So the angel of the covenant. Whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So you have an angel going to prepare the way for Christ. Right? Agreed. Okay. And, and we, we can say that is John the Baptist in the time of Christ. I mean, say, if I, yeah. I, I'll look at it, I'll, I'll, I'll add one to this. So you've got John the Baptist in the time of Christ. Elijah. You've got Elijah in the past, yes. Right. So you've, got, you've also got Martin Luther at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Right, you have Martin Luther. You've got William Miller during the Great Awakening. Mm-hmm. And you've got Jeff Pippinger at this final awakening. Mm -hmm. Now, of, of those five, is there more that can be added? What about the 144,000? Agreed. So that means that the 144,000 are going to be as a messenger to provide the instruction for the Levites so that all of the earth can hear this final message. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Well, they would include the Levites. Yeah, well, we, we always conclude the Levites with 144,000. Yes, so, so they're bringing in the Nethanims. Well, no. No, I don't put the Nethanim. I mean, how are you cl classifying the Nethanim? Would you the include Nethanims them are the, the Protestants, you're saying, right? Would you include them with the hundred? Are they part of the 144,000? No. No, Nethanim aren't. So you're talking about the Protestants when you talk about the Nethanim. Correct? The ones who yes. aren't virgins. The ones yes. who aren't of the children of Israel, but labor in the temple. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, in, in the cross-references that I have looked at with this, mm -hmm. Behold, I will send my messenger. And they gave reference, reference to Matthew 11.10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. 
what was Christ speaking of at that point? Was he not speaking of John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. And then Mark 1, verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Luke 1, 76, and thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And then Luke 7, 27, this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Here is God providing his messenger, providing his message so that people would be prepared for what Christ has to say. Then as we look as preparing the way before me, Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Was this not exactly what John the Baptist was doing? Was this not exactly what Elijah was doing? What William Miller was doing? And what Jeff has done? Mm-hmm. Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. And then he shall come, gives reference to Haggai 2, verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, earlier in the studies, we covered the fact that the glory that was given to that temple was not the Shekinah, but it was Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Does this not represent the 144,000 today? Because mm -hmm. Christ is supposed to come into his temple. We've talked about that temple being built, which is this movement, this message. The living stones. Mm -hmm. So, And the mistake we can't make is just believing that the same old, same old is going to suffice exactly yeah. how else are we to look at this how else should this be handled mm -hmm. i mean we're looking at the historical applications here of malachi 3 verse 1 is there a figurative example that we should be considering I know it's not an easy thought process, is it? No. Well, when I look at Malachi chapter three and you see the work of the refiner, I mean, we know that God has been purifying his people. He's been bringing them through trials. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know what trial other than to just continue trust continually trusting in God, the trial of our faith, in spite of what we see. But we also, 
we have to change. And we have to ask God to change us. I mean, in some ways, we're coming right back to a basic conversion process. We're coming to the basic conversion process. But as the verse says, who may abide the day of his coming? Mm -hmm. And when they're giving reference on this, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all of the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble mm -hmm. and the day that cometh shall burn them up saith the lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch so if there is neither root nor branch that means that all of these teachings all of these interpretations that are not built upon proof texting will be destroyed mm -hmm. And who shall stand when he appeareth? And here again, Revelation 6, 17, asks the question again. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The 144,000? But who's going to be able to stand against them? Is Caiaphas going to be able to stand? I don't think so. How many others that have been so proud that have stated that, well, proof texting, no, that, that, it's not scholarly. That you can set aside Cruden's concordance because Cruden's is for the crude. Strong's is for the strong. Young's is for the young. I've never heard that. <laughs> well, that. That's one of the things that runs through the Adventist college system. Mm. I mean, I, I've had enough conversations with others. I mean, they, they literally want to dismiss whatever there is in Cruden's and their, their entire idea is Strong's is the best because it's for those that are the strongest in the word of God. Yeah. Well, honestly, there are times that I look at this with Strong's. I mean, the, the, the Hebrew and Greek numbering system is great, but there's too much reliance upon it. It's almost like using a cane. Well, the problem that I have with it is that Strong's, he didn't really understand Hebrew or Greek. Okay. Um, it's, it's not a good dictionary. No. But it's a useful tool. Okay. But, but often he uses definitions that, that aren't in the scriptures. The thing about um, when you define a word in the Bible, you need to define it by the Bible itself not by some Greek use of a word or, um, you know, especially the, with the Greek, you're not gonna depend upon the definition of how it's used in, in the Greek language if it's not used in the Bible that way. Okay. But uh, that's the problem I have with Strong's is that people, they make a lot of mistakes when they use Strong's too. But, but anyway, that's, I mean, to me, that's not really the issue here as much as are we going to accept what God's word plainly has taught this movement and the method of study that the movement came to understand, how we came to understand the things that it did. Right. So, and the question is, are we going to do that? I don't know about anybody else. I think we're going to have to do it. I don't see that we have a choice. Hmm. 
it's it's like do we believe that god is capable of keeping his word mm -hmm. we've talked many times that you know god is more than more than able to protect his word but in these situations are we willing to exercise our faith in this way are we willing to be so direct that we believe that the word of God is enough that we can rely on it no matter what else comes mm -hmm. so he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap and the verses that they referred to there Isaiah 4.4 4, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Then we come to Matthew 3. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree with which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's interesting. You read this, and all I can think of is whose brush in it is in his hand, and who will thoroughly restore his casket. So, here again, we have many examples, both in the past and in the present, for us to be able to look upon this verse in a very literal manner. But do we have a figurative application that we have not considered? Hmm. What can we see for us today? What path should we be walking on? And how can we take to heart the admonition that's being given to us in these verses? I mean, this is what I've been struggling with for a few years now, three years at least, if you go sure. back to 2018. And, you know, once we had, we had made a prediction, I mean, to me, it was fine studying things in the past, understanding the structure of prophetic chronology. But as soon as we now were making a prediction about what's going to happen in the future, then that's where I had a problem in that that's a huge responsibility and who are we to to say that but god led us in our prediction and you never want to deceive someone so when we came to july 18th we had to be confident that what that god was telling us to do what we did in giving right. that warning and so now we've had to struggle with, well, what's the next step? We don't have Jeff anymore. And we're just, we're doing the best that we can. But we have to trust that God's still leading this movement. We don't have Jeff anymore. Yeah. But we, we do have the word of God. Yeah, yeah, we do. But, you know, Jeff was 
it was some he was somebody we leaned on and sometimes we leaned on him too much yeah I say that not only for us, but I say that also for those that may listen to this later. Yeah. We should not in any regard be re so reliant upon the arm of flesh that we do not study for ourselves, question, search, and dig. Mm -hmm. When we fail to do that, we are no better than the Pharisees or Sadducees. And that is a role I don't want to see. I don't want to see that applied to me. Mm -hmm. We're being yeah. asked, who can stand? We know that this great day of God's wrath is yet to come. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be able to stand? We have to consider what are we doing today? Well, we're studying. We're delving deep into the word. We have verses that we're coming up with. We don't fully understand them. We have to be able to take them and digest them as Father Miller had done. Moving no faster then he was able to understand those verses. Mm -hmm. We have a lot before us. Any thoughts? Any questions? This morning I was... Um laying in bed, praying and thinking about these things. And the Lord, I believe, revealed to me that, because I was, I was thinking back through this idea of priests and Levites in the movement. Sure. And one thing came to me was, uh, and I'm not sure the correct word to use, but I'm going to use the word janitors. Um, in many ways, we refer to Jesus as the dirt brush man, mm -hmm. and we need to work in concert, if you please, as janitors to help bring back that, and only he can do it. We know that it's only by his spirit that anyone can change, because we can't change our own spots, right? Right. But... If we can work in concert as a janitor to help help bring the the full view of the beauty of these gems, that seemed to me something that he was telling me this morning. Well, let's add to that. Was Jacob, when he left his father's house initially, was he worthy of being prepared to wrestle with God. I'm sure he was not. So the 20 years that he spent with his uncle Laban, with dealing with the wives, dealing with his children, were preparing him for the time that he needed to be able to come face to face with Christ and wrestle him that evening because he thought this was going to be one that was going to cause his demise and the demise of his children. An enemy. Now, not many of us look that this was a 91 year old man that was doing this. Too many times in too many churches, he is shown as being maybe in his 40s. This was a man that had been through the ringer.
he was emotionally and spiritually beat up. We are no better than Jacob today. We need to have the faith that Jacob had that God would be able to make good his word. The sooner we have that faith, the sooner we accept that in our lives, the sooner we will be able to be prepared to leave this and exodus this world. Shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father, we come before you, we know that we need the faith of Abraham. We need the spirit of the Jacob that wrestled with you. And we need the depth of faith of Daniel. Direct us now, Father. Help us that we may learn more. Guide us and prepare us for that which you would have us to do. Be with us now as we go our ways through this day. Help us and prepare us for that which we need to learn. Show us, Father, so that we may more properly reflect your character. And if we do, that we may more properly reflect your character as Moses did when he came back from the top of the mountain. Guide us to this end. Be with us, we ask. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm.